the the real secret is really the structure and we always say the more you invest into the research the better the script will be and then if you have the right structure the better the performance will be later on hi everyone and welcome to grow deep i'm your host michel daniel we talk to pretty awesome business builders who are designing disruptive and meaningful companies hi everybody today we receive christian hopper co-founder of forward agency He helps e-commerce brands drive revenue and growth with performance-based YouTube ads. He has 15 years of digital marketing and advertising experience, working as a fractional CMO and for various agencies, including iProspect. Christian knows how to run effective ads, but he's also passionate about sustainability. Welcome to the show, Christian. You have a wealth of experience in e-commerce and have helped uh, many brands grow over the past couple of years. Can you share with us how you first got started in the industry and what inspired you to start your own agency? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's funny because I started as a freelancer. I worked in agencies. Then I worked on a client side to help the DTC brand build the whole DTC basically from scratch help them to grow to 100 million in three years and then I started my own agency so I've been on all sides working in agencies working on a client side with agencies then started my own agency but how I got started was actually after school I just didn't know what should I study and if I should study I couldn't see myself invest three five more years and so with zero experience and no clients nothing I just started freelancing which was I don't know if I would do it again probably yes now looking back but it was <laughs> it was a, quite, a tough time But it was also good because I, I just uh, learned everything doing it myself. And uh, yeah, after some time, it just helped. Uh, it just happened that after I left Waterdrop, the brand where I built the D2C, we had a couple of other businesses, uh, inquirers, and, and st said, hey, can you help us uh, also to leverage YouTube ads? And yeah, so we started working with them. And that's basically how the agency was born. You have a lot of experience in, in digital advertising. And now you're really focused on YouTube ads. And in the industry, what has you know, been the norm is that video used to be branding, right? A lot of people say video is, is for branding campaigns, but that's not your approach. You heavily focus on YouTube ads to drive growth for clients for direct response marketing. So tell us about your approach and how, I don't know if you've discovered that or if you've experimented, but how did you get to that point where you use YouTube ads really to drive performance? Yeah, it was 2000, 2021, and a lot of businesses still are dependent on Facebook ads, Meta ads. And at Waterdrop, we were just looking for another channel and some one channel that has scaling potential that has is large enough basically we needed to grow faster we needed to diversify and so we looked around and tiktok was still very early and pinterest snapchat is not really significant so we looked at youtube and we said okay actually it's the second largest search engine right and it's also owned by google so you can say it's the largest search engines first and second largest search engine and so it has a lot of potential it has a lot of active viewers and we want to see how can we make it work and as you said most brands just see it as a awareness channel and we, that's also how we started we worked with five different google specialists video specialists and we invested or honestly burned hundred thousand euros or hundred thousand dollars pretty quickly and we had 30 percent brand lift but no in incremental revenue so we said okay where's the revenue and then we started experimenting and investing into basically courses to really understand how YouTube works. YouTube works very well for B2B, for high ticket sales, all these ads on, on YouTube where someone wants to sell you some course or some unique method, how you can become a millionaire in, in three weeks, basically. But the reason why this works is because the economics for high ticket items work, right? If you sell a $10,000 course, you can make a lot of money on, on this because the economics work. It's very, very hard to make YouTube work on first order profitability when you have a $50, $50 or $100 AOV. It took us a year, but we really invested in how should the creative look like and how should the media buying side look like to make it work. And it worked really well. In the end, we were able to drive uh, several hundred thousand dollar ad spend at profitable ROAS. And uh, yeah, this is a short summary, but there was a lot of uh, work going in there. Right. Well, let's let's drill down on this while while we're on it. So you talked about B2B high ticket companies. YouTube is is one of the great avenues to explore for for advertising. 
you've kind of cracked the code for e-commerce or smaller items or D2C type of brands. What's the secret? What, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, sure. we, we, we don't have a lot of time, but what, why, what works and what have you learned over the past few years? Yeah. So I've heard a lot of brands that said, hey, we tried YouTube ads and it didn't work and then they don't try again. And, and we were in the same position. So very happy to share the secrets, basically. So it comes down to two things. The first one is the creative and it's very different. A lot of brands just take either the TV commercial or take maybe a Facebook ad, meta ad and run it on YouTube and see if it works. And YouTube is a very different platform. It works very differently than other platforms. And that's why you also need to adjust the strategy for the creative. What is very counterintuitive on YouTube is that we don't strive for making people watch the ad. And, and what I mean by that is we don't want a high view through rate. We want actually people to actively skip the ads that are not our ideal target audience. That's a bit counterintuitive if you think about it. But the reason why is that I, I strongly believe that the creative does the targeting. So you, you still have a lot of targeting opportunities on, on YouTube. But what we aim for is that the creative differentiates between, okay, this is a viewer that is actually our ideal audience and this is not a viewer that is uh, our ideal audience. So we want to make everyone skip who we don't think is the ideal audience. For example, if I go in with a, with a hook and say, hey, do you have struggles sleeping at night? I could be selling them, right, a, a pillow, a mattress. I could be selling them supplements. I could be selling them an app. So many different things. So some people might not be open for supplements. They're just looking for maybe a more comfortable mattress or something else, right? So you have to be very clear. And also, for example, if you're selling higher price items, you want to make that very clear already in the beginning so that those people that say, hey, this is interesting, but I'm not willing to pay that price for it, they skip. And that helps the algorithm then optimize also for more, more for those people that actually are the ideal custom audience. So we have some clients that, for example, uh, the SaaS business in that case, but they sell, yeah, I would say like an image processing or editing SaaS and, and their audience is very specifically print on demand designers, businesses. So very different than, than the broad audience. So we have another D2C client that sells con convenience food and their target audience are sporty people because of the high protein in the products. So you, you got to be very clear and, and actually make the creative target the, the user. So this is the one part and the second secret is really the media buying part. There's a lot of hype now about performance marks, about all these black box campaigns. Google wants, of course, to earn more money. And so they put just everything together in one campaign and, and think, OK, we don't tell you exactly what is what is really driving the, the growth. And unfortunately, YouTube is still very manual. So that's a bit of experience needed. But yeah, also here we, we kind of crack the code. Are you using performance max or...? We're also using Performance Max, but we see it more like an extension, right? So it is it has its benefits when you go to new markets, for example, and you just want to test it. And it also has the potential to tap into everything else. But we also want to kind of build a, a structure first where we understand, okay, what comes in, what goes out, what is really driving revenue and where, where are you more uh, or less wasting money. And then on top, build the Performance Max to capture everything else. Instead of just saying we, we trust Google and here's a black box, we don't know, but the results overall okay. But then that doesn't give you the flexibility to really optimize. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the creative and how you approach that because also uh, in the past, brands looked at video as an awareness product. And a, a lot of companies did not touch video because of its complexity, right? You, you you need to, if you want to put out something that that is professional, that you like, how do you work with brands and with your clients on the on the creative side? Since you, you kind of know what works, but how does it work? Do you actually create some of uh, the creatives yourself or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So. The interesting part, maybe one assumption in, in the beginning, that high quality creatives don't necessarily perform better than low quality creatives, surprise, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, even on YouTube. So we had productions with the same script, basically, that cost 2,500 and we had pro the same production 50,000 and the 2,500 performed better than the 50,000. That's because the 50,000 was more like a TV commercial in, in terms of quality, same script but it was just too polished, it was too perfect. Mm -hmm. And our assumption or our reasoning is that as a viewer, you immediately understand, hey, this is an ad, this is not organic content. 
So it is important to make it fit into the platform. So this is one aspect, but the, the real secret is really the structure. And we always say the more you invest into the research, the better the script will be. And then if you have the right structure, the better the performance will be later on. And how we do that is really scraping reviews, understanding what customers love about your service, your product, and also understanding what competitors, for example, what they don't do or what are their objections when it comes to your competitors' products. So you can really put all this into, into the creative. And then it can be either UGC production, sometimes even stock footage, AI voiceover works, especially for quick testing or higher end production. If, if it's a brand that says, okay, we tested the channel, it works, let's put more quality in it. Then you can hire an actor, get a professional shooting done for, for bigger investments. Yeah, there's a lot of talks these days about how ugly ads are, perf are yeah. performing <laughs> beautiful ads. That's great. Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah, but it, it also fits with the, the platform, right? There's a lot of unpolished uh, videos on, on YouTube as well. Budget is also an interesting topic. You hear pretty much everything along the whole spectrum. Some people are saying invest like a, a dollar a day and you'll have a pretty convincing data about if your ad is working or not. Others are saying to actually run ads and, and really learn and, and find the right path. You need to invest a lot more. What kind of budget do you need on, on YouTube to start seeing results? Yeah. So to be honest, although we focus on YouTube ads, we never really recommend businesses to start with YouTube ads because as you said, there is a certain budget required to really have a reasonable test. So what we've seen sometimes with businesses that start with YouTube ads, although they haven't tested anything else is that maybe they don't have market fit yet or or maybe their page doesn't convert yet and then to invest into paid advertising or specifically youtube ads where you have to invest into producing some form of creative is is much bigger step than just going on on facebook on meta and test some static creatives quickly and do some angle testing and understand okay this message works better than this one in general so we always encourage uh, businesses to do that first I think YouTube is, is not necessarily for, for at least an e-commerce space for businesses that do maybe one, two million or less a year. It starts to be very interesting for businesses that do five million or more a year. In, in that range, you are actually missing out because your competitors are there, right? We talked about uh, YouTube being the second largest search engine. You can bid on your competitors also on a YouTube perspective. So on that stage, it, it starts to become interesting. The minimum budget that usually for a normal e-commerce brand that we normally recommend to get started is, is around 10,000 a month. This is kind of the lower end to invest in, in terms of media spend to, to really see how it works and, and what creative works. And with this, you can test around 10 different messages, maybe 15 different messages and understand, okay, this, this creative uh, works better than, yeah. But you can invest a lot more. The, the, the beautiful part on the other side is that there is a very low ad fatigue. So that means we've spent several million on one single creative and it's still the best performing, which is not so common on other platforms where you have to change creatives very often. Mm -hmm. But well, why is that? You, you still have a frequency capping on this? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that the algorithm from on Meta, for example, works interesting in interesting ways. So if you have, a, a let's say, an audience of one million people, Meta would not necessarily show your ad to 1 million people, but would first show it to 5% or 10% of the audience and then just increase the frequency. I guess it's also a bit of the quality of the of the ad, right? On Meta, you have 80% sound off. The They consume very little of the creative. They skip very fast. On YouTube, it's different. You have 95% sound on, so it's, it's quite the opposite. And we work with long-form creatives, uh, so it's up to three minutes. So that also means like you pre-qualify the audience much more. And if you think about it, that you can put your landing page into a creative and the beautiful part of it is that if you're interested as a, as a viewer, you watch the first seconds and say, okay, actually this is a problem that I have. I've been looking for a solution. So let me just continue watching. You don't have to click away, right? You can consume all that is usually on a landing page in the video without changing the platform, without being interrupted. If at any point you say, well, that's not for me, skip. But until then you get way more education in, in the video. And we also see that on on-site metrics. So we see much higher pages per session, average session duration than on Meta, 50, 100% higher usually. So that's that also speaks for the quality. And I guess that's why the ad fatigue is also lower on, on YouTube. 
If you design, you write a script and you you, you work on an, an ad creative for YouTube ads and that creative is performing well, mm. can you recycle that and assume that it's going to perform as well on Instagram, TikTok or others? Most likely not <laughs> because it's long form. So it's, it's again, very different platform. We work with creatives that are usually around two and a half to three minutes. That's the golden range. If it's longer than three minutes, you pay higher so on, on YouTube. But you, that's really the, the, the length that is needed to get everything into the creative that you want to get into the creative. So that is, again, different on, on Meta. You have also sound off, so it's much, much more difficult um, to get the same message across. And how do you write like a high converting script or you, you, you mm. talked uh, earlier yeah. about doing some research, but like if we try to get more concrete a little bit, how does, mm -hmm. how does that look like? Yeah, so you want to go directly in the beginning, like on other platforms with a hook that starts with either problem or desire. What we learned here is that positive works much better than negative in 90% of the cases. So instead of really speaking about what people don't want, speak about what people want. So kind of a desire focus or a positively framed solution. Then you want to really tell consumers or the viewers directly how you're solving a problem. As with this example, if you struggle sleeping at night, you want to be very concrete. What is the solution that you offer so that the viewer can decide, okay, this is something I want to learn more about. Then we enter something like a call, early call to action, which is not a major call to action, but it's something either you can do that by saying, hey, if you're already ready to learn more, click here. But a more a better way maybe is just showing a screen recording of the website while you continue talking. So people understand, hey, I can actually buy this, this product, this service on the website and they get familiar with the checkout process. And then we go into this educate part and here you can really add a lot. First of all, building trust, of course, reviews what others say. So it can be that you have a, a short supercut of testimonials, three testimonials from real customers, ideally, or other ways to, to build trust. And then really going into everything that you usually put on a landing page, right? All the objections that you have, hey, why should this mattress be better than anything else or anything that you really want to want to tackle uh, until you come then to the end where you have uh, the call to action and you, ha you can have a stacked call to action so it's not only one call to action it's basically as long as the viewer continues watching you can have another sense of urgency another scarcity uh, another reason uh, until people actually click so that's in a very rough overview and you know, the, the structure okay. and what are the typical mistakes that you see uh, either clients or other companies do with their ads? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I mean, first of all, a lot burn soil because they they try YouTube ads in, in the wrong way. We've been there as well, so I really understand that. And then they don't try again. I also understand that because they say, hey, we, we spent money, it didn't work. Why should we spend money again? And that's usually because they don't invest or they don't know about the ideal structure of the creative. They don't invest in the research or they get the media buying right. We, we had clients where we started working with them basically from scratch. We made YouTube in three months, the largest channel. So really from not doing anything there. Then they said, okay, let's let us do this in-house. And we always support that. And they changed everything. So basically the creatives were the same, but they started changing things on their structure and everything tanked. And two months later, they called us and said, hey, can you help us again? And we started working again. It took us again two months to reverse everything. So there's really, again, the, the creative part, plus also to, to understand how you build the structures. You don't want to put everything in one campaign and this can work really well for some time and then it crashes. So you want to build out a structure that is more horizontal, how we call it. So to have, again, more control, flexibility still, give flexibility to the algorithm, but also understand what works and, and what doesn't work to, to optimize manually. So basically when people start working with you, because I've been in the digital advertising world for a while as well, and they all want results like yesterday, of when, <laughs> when people start working with you, like with forward agency, like what's the, what's the process? Like how do you onboard them? What kind of expectations they can have? Yeah, good question. So we start with the research and the script. That's, that's the most important part. We also invest really a lot in, into this part. And from then, it depends on the creative process, right? So it can be very quick and easy production, maybe taking existing material, taking voiceover, doing a creative, or it can be a professional production. Usually we start with a simple creative just to test the concept. And from going live, it's around three to four weeks where you can see results. So we have some early metrics that where we see, okay, is it going in the right direction? 
but then within a month usually you already see results of course you can iterate and and go from there but it's it is very very quick it's not a channel where you can go from zero to hundred thousand a day also to be transparent it's something where you add 30 percent 50 percent more a week or a week but it's also very stable then yeah so this is in terms of expectations from what I understand, you are an agency that has what you call a transparent fee structure. How does that work? Like how, again, if uh, we decide to work with you to tomorrow, mm-hmm. what should I expect in terms of fees and the amount I need to invest monthly? Yeah. Yeah. So we went away from a percentage of revenue and percentage of ad spend. I think it has, first of all, a conflict of interest because then as agency, we would just try to push the client to spend more. We did that in the beginning because that's how many agencies work. And of course, it's very profitable for them. But we just say, okay, our service is this. We charge basically a flat fee per for our work for media buying and a separate fee for the creatives. And that's also because the creative patch, you can run very long with one one creative patch and that's separated. And then it depends on the amount of markets and languages and, and stuff like this. But uh, yeah, I think it's it's a very fair model. We do have some agreements also with clients. If you say, hey, we check the accounts. And in the meantime, we have so much experience that we say, hey, we give you a guarantee. If we don't achieve that, we don't charge you. So you don't pay us uh, because we know that in 90 plus percent of the cases, we we understand, okay, this is a product that works on YouTube with, with this landing page, with this current numbers, we can make it work as well. And how much of the work do you also do uh, in terms of the, the funnel, the, the entire funnel? So there's the, the creatives, yeah. there's the optimization, but you also get involved on the, the landing pages? and Yes, we do. So we we get started with the landing pages that there are because the, the biggest impact, the biggest uplift you have with creative testing. But once you have creatives where you know, okay, these creatives work better, then it's all about the funnel, as you said. So we create, I would say, customized checkouts for e-commerce companies. It's It's very straightforward. But there are also higher ticket companies or SaaS businesses where the funnel might look different. The, the reason is you have way more impressions than you have clicks. So iterating the creatives first is, is much creates a much bigger impact. And then when you have the, the right clicks on a landing page, you can optimize the landing page. I want to shift gear a little bit because you, re- you really know your stuff. But I was listening to other interviews that you've given and you seem to be a, I have to be careful with how I describe you, but a, a very Zen advertising, oh, uh, a guru or expert. And I'd like to tell you to tell me a little bit about how you see things uh, in life, how you've decided to create your own agency, how it fits with your, I don't know, I don't know if you've, it's life design or lifestyle design or or if you've got to a point where you say, well, maybe the, the more traditional agencies are not necessarily the right fit for me. Like, what's your life philosophy? Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you for the question. It's a very interesting question. I, I never want to start an agency, to be honest. It's not something when I was working in agencies, I was like, wow, this is really stressful. And it is, honestly. So it's not it's not an easy thing or an enjoyable thing, even if it may, might look like this on the outside. But I think you develop a very thick skin because you have to go through a lot. But yeah, I, I, it just happened, right? And I, I think we've seen that there's a lot of potential. And what I didn't enjoy when I was working in agencies is that you cannot choose the clients. So I had to kind of work with the businesses that were given to me. And I thought, because you also touched on sustainability, there are definitely red lines or businesses where I want to work with and, and others I would not like to work with so much. And to have this flexibility to really say, and I have to say we have really nice clients, amazing clients that we really enjoy working with and where we think, okay, um, they are amazing businesses. They're really doing a lot of good things and um, where it also really makes, yeah, gives gives you a feeling of, of sense of purpose to, to help them to be successful. So it, it sounds a bit cliche, but we really, with my co-founder, we often talk and think think like, hey, we really want to make it work for this business. We really want to help them be successful because we just enjoy the founders, we enjoy the team, we enjoy the products, we enjoy what they're doing. And it's just a real great pleasure to work with. And I think that's important because if you don't enjoy that and and think, okay, actually, I don't really stand behind what they're doing, then it's very tough. And it also creates this, this conflict of interest. And have you changed anything in how you run operations like versus maybe when you were younger in agencies? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So 
Yeah, we were, I mean, in the last, I've been in the startup space, basically on client side, and there's of course a lot of politics involved in businesses naturally when they grow. And uh, there were a lot of things. It was often about FaceTime, not really results, although it was portrayed differently. And I think that's normal, right? It's not for any specific company. I think that happens also. I've seen it a couple of times where when businesses grow, things change. So we, we are not a large agency in, in that sense. We really try to focus on driving results. We're completely remote. We give maximum flexibility to our team members. They can work whenever they want, basically. So there's no fixed hours. We don't think how much someone works, but it's in the end, it's about the result. And we try also to pass on the success of the agency to to the team. And uh, yeah, that, that's very, very good. And we have a lot of, you know, the stories that we create, it's it's very rewarding as well. And, and I'm very grateful that for that. If you hear how much impact that actually has on, on other people's life and uh, how this, this changed working with us as well. So it's kind of this win-win situation where we help brands become more successful and uh, at the same time create something where it also has a positive impact on um, our team and the people we work with. Have you started looking into the sustainability of adver digital advertising itself? Is this, there's a lot of talks. There's scope three in that has been investing in measuring uh, actually the the footprint of the entire supply chain. Um, yeah. More and more clients also are asking for for some sort of data. What, what's your take on that? My my honest take is that every consumption is is bad is not sustainable, and you have to be. So honest that whatever you whatever you consume, it it has an impact. If you think about Patagonia, they advertised don't buy this jacket because you know, in the end you need to think, do you really need this? Uh, I think for us it was clear we don't want to support anything like drop shipping or anything like this and just really try to work with businesses. But the honest truth is advertising is controversial, whatever you do. I mean, like you try to promote consumption. So that's that's really the thing that is has its downsides and I, I want to be just very honest here you you can always try to minimize it but the the fact is that in the end consumption is not sustainable no matter no matter in what form mm, i agree i agree but i also think that advertising is useful so that people who have businesses can promote what they sell right so then then you get to the next level which is do you really need a second yet <laughs> <laughs> or did yeah. you actually need the first one in the first place, right? Yeah. So then True. there's questions about consumption. But you know, yeah. you were mentioning B two B businesses where some are obviously uh, selling how you can become rich in three weeks, uh, which might mm. not you know fit in the right category either. But there's a lot of businesses where they to be successful, like you do with your clients, they need to be seen, right? So no, I agree with you. It's a True. It's complicated. It's a complicated topic. Yeah. I mean, uh, what you qu can think of is that if you help someone who would, because there are people, right? People need to consume to to live basically, and to also have a decent life and enjoy their life. I think that's also important. And and you can also think of if someone wanted to consume something, then you at least help them go in the right direction and consume something that is more sustainable than maybe an alternative. So that's kind of how I try to see it. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I like that. I'm trying to get someone who specializes in or who's very well versed in degrowth to get on the podcast. I, I find it quite fascinating as well, but we'll we'll leave that for, for another day. You have uh, mentioned that you try to give as much flexibility as possible for uh, your team. Uh, you are fully uh, remote. Uh, where are people based in general? Well, I would say pretty much everywhere uh, we, we have team members around the globe which is quite fascinating because it involves a lot of different cultures and backgrounds and that's very very interesting and yeah it's it's crazy to see how they also grow together and and uh, how they work together I, i'm personally austrian from from center of europe my co-founder is from france and i've been also been traveling a lot and and checking out which are the the best places to to be and yeah so we have we have people i would say in, in many places you went from working in agencies being a, a fractional cmo to actually starting your own business can you tell us a little bit about that journey and how things have been going for you as a business owner yeah also that this was not planned it it also happened kind of and 
I, I worked at Waterup. I came to them when there was no online team, nothing, as, as to help them build the whole D2C space. And back then there were, it was a super small office, almost nobody. I was the first employee in, in for D2C for online. And we built the whole team, basically. I built four, four teams with different people. And after two and a half years, it was it became a very different company, natural, because it grew a lot, revenue-wise, team-wise, structure-wise. And then I just realized, okay, it's it's the time for me to to change because you know there there is a certain time and and period. And yeah, it was a great time. And then I didn't really know uh, how I would proceed. I had other offers to again join uh, other companies. And then I just when I announced that I leave, then certain things happened and fo- fell into place. And I always like to quote. Steve Jobs, where where he said, you can only connect the dots backwards. Sometimes you just have to trust the process. And it's crazy now when I think back how things fell into place and I ended up where I want, where I never thought I will be. And I never planned to do that, but that's just how things happened. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's it's been a very interesting journey. I have to say it's, you, you develop a very thick skin. It's not always easy, but after some time you, you get used to it. Where, where do you find your clients? It, it happened that when I announced basically that I leave Waterdrop and uh, we start this agency with my, my co-founder together that a lot of there were a lot of businesses that came to us. So it was basically through my network how we got started and then recommendations and yeah, again, a lot of organic growth actually. And what's been the toughest part of uh, launching Forward Agency? Or You talked about developing a, a, a thick skin yeah, of course. I mean, not everything goes well, right? And I have a very high quality standards and expectations also towards myself. And you cannot control everything. So sometimes things happen where you rely on external people and or whatever, and, and things don't go as as I wanted it to, to be. I, I realized later that my expectations are still sometimes much higher than the client's expectations. But I also want to do the best I can for the businesses. And uh, even if the client is happy, but I'm not happy, then the expectation is is to improve here. And yeah, it's just a, a living organism, basically. And you have to improve, but also accept that not everything is always perfect. And there are ups and downs and it's a roller coaster. Uh, but as long as the overall trend is upwards, then everything is good. <laughs> and you have just to enjoy the journey, which is something, I, I, a quote that I never really understood, but it's it's really all about about that. And how do you structure the um, actual services? Because scaling um, a, a service or an agency, a service business is complicated, um, especially if your offering is relatively uh, broad. Uh, is there anything particular in a uh, forward agency where you say like, this is how we work and this makes our work and the quality of our work a lot better? Yeah, we, we, we focus on what we're really good at I mean, I've been working in D2C. I've been, I've done everything myself. From when I when I started Waterdrop, I basically cropped images for the product detail pages myself and set everything up and wrote copy and etc. So I've done all the e-commerce, the operational e-commerce part until we built the e-commerce team. I've worked in CRM. I built all the CRM, the analytics, etc. And the same for paid. I come from a performance agency. I've I've set up the basic structures for everything. I've hired people. I've we started working together. So I've seen pretty much everything, but we still focus on one core aspect where we think, okay, this is where we are really the best. And that's what we've seen is really worth it. Of course, you tap into other services here and there, but for us, it's YouTube ads and and Google ads, paid search shopping, where we see, okay, this is something where we drive the best results for clients. And that's what we focus on. And yeah, that's that's something where I know from from the feedback, from the results that we drive, that this is the the core and this is what we're going to do. And what's your your plan for Ford Agency in the next, I don't know, 6, 12 months, but also in general, I, I was talking to somebody else earlier and she was basically saying that her business is her um, retirement plan. And mm-hmm. what about you? Like, what does Ford Agency mean for you in your in your life right now and also in the future? Good question. So one part is we want to really get more businesses successful, even the ones that we don't work with. So we are launching Forward Thinking, which is in parallel to Forward Agency, kind of a platform where we're going to share a lot of content in terms of podcasts, in terms of newsletters, blogs, etc. We just share everything that we do. 
for free and, and people can access it because there is a lot of businesses where we say openly, hey, look, it doesn't make sense for us to work together, but still why not share what we what we learned? And on the other side, I, I also uh, believe that the best way is to become a product of your product. So we are also investing and in building our own e-commerce businesses in in segments where we think oh, there's a lot of potential and also show how it can be done. So these are two pillars. I have to say it's still stressful and, and all it takes a lot of time to run an agency. So all of this takes extra efforts and the core focus will still be working with our core clients. We don't have any plans to hyperscale and, and, and blow up the agency with a lot of teams because we know that the quality cannot stay there. So that's a, a certain set of clients where we know, okay, we can deliver What's the most fun for you? Because it's it's different to run a business than to actually do specific service in an agency or in a corporate world. What's the most fun for you? The the most fun is really when this small moment when you when you can celebrate the wins and okay this is this all the efforts is worth it. I, I love the the movie The Pursuit of Happiness. I don't know if you've seen it, but basically in the end it is where he shares that this is the moment when all the efforts that you put into it pays off. I think this is always rewarding and I, I really enjoy these moments. And yeah. Yeah, I agree because sometimes the the efforts that come in can uh, take a while, right? Exactly. <laughs> Before you actually exactly. see the results. Yeah, I totally agree. Exactly. Yeah. Do you have any last advice for our audience? Any either for people who would like to start their business or for people who are contemplating YouTube ads? Anything? Yeah, good question. I, I, I want to come back to what, what I said before is like you can connect the dots only backwards, really trust in, in the process. If there's something that you want to do, do it. And as soon as you take the decision and you say, okay, this is where I want to be, this is where I want to go. It's interesting how things fall into place. And uh, if you're open for it and allow this, this energy to flow and, and things to happen, then this will come true. I've seen it a lot of times. Thank you so much, uh, Christian, and we will be keeping an eye out for forward thinking in your podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And as usual, you can find the show notes at stunana.com. 